Welcome to Leading with Empathy and Allyship, where we have deep, real conversations about um, empathy and allyship and being more inclusive leaders in our workplaces and communities. So I'm Melinda Brianna Epler. I'm the founder and CEO of Change Catalyst, where we build inclusive innovation through training, consulting, and events. This is a safe space to learn, to build empathy, to understand tangible actions we can all take to build a better world for our colleagues, for our neighbors, friends, and for ourselves, actually, um, because this all um, makes the world a better place for everybody. So this is a special summer season four, where I talk about some of our most, our most requested topics and also answer questions from you all. Um, today is episode 52, where we'll be talking about recognizing and overcoming microaggressions. And this is part two, but again, don't worry if you missed part one, definitely go back and have a listen to it later. Uh, you can find that at ally.cc, but glad you're here listening now. So we'll talk about some common nonverbal microaggressions and how to catch them, some common environmental, regress uh, environmental microaggressions and how to dismantle them. And then a brief overview of micro interventions. We won't be able to go too deep into this, but I'll give you some ideas to try. And then we might visit that in a future episode. So on screen, we have our ASL interpreters. Um, if you all, uh, as I present, if you all can't, yeah, thank you, Michelle. 52, woo, um, 52 episodes. Um, so if, if I'm, when I'm presenting, if you all can't see the interpreters, please, uh, just let us know and, and Araya or Renzo or somebody on the team can help you. And thank you to our amazing team for doing all the work that you do. They are in the chat and the Q&A. So um, please feel free to reach out if you have any technical issues or any questions about Change Catalyst or anything else. And, and then engage in the chat. Please continue. You all are doing amazing um, with that. And I really appreciate you. It helps me a lot and I enjoy it. And, I, I, and I've heard good feedback from, from our feedback forums actually around uh, all that you share in the chat and that interaction. So please continue. All right, I am going to share my screen. So, as you all know, I am Melinda Brianna Epler, founder and CEO of Change Catalyst. And today I, well, always, I'm a white woman with long red hair. I'm wearing a sleeveless turquoise shirt today and black and white glasses. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at mbriana Epler or on Instagram at change catalysts with an S and also on LinkedIn. Um, and this slide shows a picture of myself uh, in Hayes Valley in San Francisco. Um, and a logo change catalyst and then the text as well that I'm kind of reading through. So I create inclusive ecosystems using human systems design, storytelling, community building, and behavioral science. And I'm an author. So my new book, How to Be an Ally with McGraw-Hill is being printed. You all, many of you all know this by now. Um, and if you can aff afford a little token of appreciation to me, and also it's, it should be a great learning um, for you. I'd appreciate your purchasing a copy and also sharing it with friends and colleagues and, and reviewing it on um, Amazon or wherever you buy it um, after you've read it to uh, definitely helpful. It includes historical context, frameworks, data, stories, some personal stories, some stories people have told me and a whole lot of ways that you can take action. So, uh, and, and, and again, if you, uh, e please email us if you want to order any in bulk, um, whether you want to do it for your team or your company or your school or friends, uh, we'll make sure you get a discounted rate. So it's contact at changecatalyst.co. And Araya is putting that in the chat. Thank you. Okay, so for this special season four over the summer, I am diving into some of the subjects in the book. And also they happen to be the most requested topics in our audience feedback forum. So we've heard you and responded with this special season. Just a reminder that allyship is recognizing that there's an imbalance in opportunity and using your power and your privilege to change it. As allies, we learn, we show empathy, we take action the key, and we use our power and our influence to create positive change um, for our colleagues, our friends, our neighbors, for each other. 
And uh, these are the steps in, in my book about uh, the steps allies can take. Um, step one is un learn, unlearn, relearn. Step two, do no harm, which starts with recognizing that we have biases that we've learned from families, from friends, from media, from TV and film and um, from society and working to understand those biases and correct them. So we talked about that uh, earlier this season. And then the second part of doing no harm is recognizing microaggressions and overcoming them so we don't do them. Um, these are some of the harmful things and some of the most harmful things, um, and, and they are little, and sometimes they can feel little, um, but they add up over time and they can make a big difference in people's lives. So in part one, last time we talked about what microaggressions are, why they're important to address, um, examples of verbal microaggressions and alternatives, and, uh, and a bit about the impact of microaggressions as well, and, uh, and how to interrupt them in ourselves. We also talked about that. And then in this episode, we'll talk about common nonverbal microaggressions and how to catch them, and then examples of environmental microaggressions, how to dismantle them, and a brief overview of some microinterventions. So again, I'm, I'm gonna talk a lot, but I love um, all that you share in the chat, your aha moments, your thoughts, your questions. Please, please put them in the chat. If you have specific questions for me to address at the end of the show, just use the Q&A. Okay, so one, another reminder here that microaggressions are everyday slights, they're insults, they're negative verbal and nonverbal communications, and whether intentional or not, they can make someone feel belittled, disrespected, unheard, unsafe, othered, tokenized, gaslighted, impeded, and otherwise like they don't feel like they belong. Um, and each individual microaggression can be harmful in the short term, Plus, as microaggressions accumulate daily, they can have a significant toll on someone's career, someone's life, someone's family in the long term. They can have an intergenerational effect as well. People with underrepresented identities account encounter microaggressions on top of the stress that everyone has, um, both at work and outside of work, which is an unfair disadvantage in our work and in our lives. And often when people learn about microaggressions, they focus on intent. That's not what I meant. I didn't intend them to feel that way or they took it the wrong way. But unintentional harm is still harm. The impact is the key. Microaggressions are experienced and felt regardless of your intent. Um, so we must move from unintentional harm to intentional allyship. Uh, we don't always know the historical context. We don't always know that cumulative effect of somebody experiencing the same microaggressions again and again. We have to trust their experience. If it matters to the person that we're working with, if it matters to the person that we're interacting with, it should matter to us as colleagues, as humans, as allies. So we did talk about last time, the short and long-term effects that can include imposter syndrome, stereotype threat, covering, code switching, general lower engagement and productivity, health issues, um, both uh, mental and physical health issues, and then leaving the company, leaving the industry. Um, so it's our job as allies to understand what microaggressions are and to make sure we don't do them. And the key is to develop our empathy skills, to be more intentional, so that we recognize the microaggression before it forms and stop it before it happens. So, there are different kinds of microaggressions, verbal, nonverbal, environmental. And we're gonna focus on nonverbal and environmental microaggressions today. So let's dive into that. Invisibilization and exclusion. Invisibilization and exclusion. So the way that this might show up is ignoring somebody's presence in the room, in the conversation or in the public space not inviting someone to a meeting when they should be there because of their expertise and role, seeing or treating two black women as interchangeable, which happens surprisingly a lot in our workplaces still, um, having non-senior level people or non-VIPs sit against the wall in a room um, versus sitting at the table. So invisibilization is a form of othering. Uh, basically it's saying, I don't see you, I don't recognize you. 
It can happen in meetings or events where no one introduces themselves to a person with an underrepresented identity. It may be you're walking down a hallway down the street and you well, pass somebody and don't see them, don't recognize them. Um, it happens to me often in my own neighborhood in San Francisco, actually in the heart of the tech industry. I walking down the street in my neighborhood, men will literally run into me because they don't see me and they expect me to move out of their way. Um, so be mindful of inclusion in meetings, um, being aware of your surroundings, being around with, aware of the people around you, invite people in the room um, where decisions are made, uh, in the room where it happens, so to speak, with a where they have a powerful position in that room at the table. Ensure everyone is introduced to everyone else. Um, make sure that you're engaging with people, with everyone, um, and humanize, empathize again. Not paying attention. Um, that might be looking at your laptop or your cell phone or otherwise multitasking when somebody is speaking. It could be taking a side, talking aside to someone when a person is sharing an idea or an experience, um, not being fully present when they are speaking, but talking to somebody else. It could be closing off your body or communicating disinterest when somebody is speaking. Um, other, other, well, give people your full attention, right? Um, so really be fully present with them. That, that might mean really facing them, uh, listening with empathy, uh, being open to their uh, what they're saying and showing that you're open to what they're saying. Close your laptop when you're in person, of course, uh, not when you're virtual. Um, put down your phone, uh, turn off your notifications, uh, pay attention. You can practice empathetic listening here, uh, which we talked about a couple of episodes ago. Um, use open body language and facial expressions that connect with the speaker that show you're truly listening and care what they have to say. If somebody's new or the only person like them in the room, or they're just nervous, it can make a huge difference if you show up for them in that, that small way. And you may also find you actually remember more about what they say. There are studies that show that when you're fully present, when you have that open body language that um, you're receiving more. Um, other other uh, facial expressions and body language, rolling your eyes or otherwise dismissing or mocking somebody, um, giving a knowing side look to somebody about somebody else. Um, you know, a lot of people can see that and feel that. Embodying dominant power positioning. So, um, that, that could be standing over somebody that could be, um, in, in, a, in a way that makes them feel closed off. That could be, um, sitting in a really dominant power positioning, uh, stance. There's a great book called, I think it's called body language, um, by, uh, by a couple, I'm blanking on their first names, but peas is their last name. And, and we'll share, we'll share a little bit, uh, we'll share that link. Uh, on ally.cc when this episode comes out. So you can take a look at that. Um, Deborah and Alan Pease, I think, um, around body language. It's, it's cool, it's interesting, it's a quick read. Become aware about how your body and facial expressions make somebody feel. Um, is somebody closing their own body language in relation to yours? That might mean that you're, you're overpowering. Are you encroaching on their physical space? Or, once you begin to recognize this in yourself, you also might be able to see this in other people too, all of this, and, um, and so you can interrupt it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Kevin, uh, Kevin says, um, candidate Trump creeping up behind candidate Hillary at the debate in 2016. That's absolutely right, absolutely right. Um, definitely some microaggressions there, for sure. Thank you, Michelle, the definitive book of body language by Alan and Barbara Pease, thank you. Um, touching people without permission, touching somebody's wheelchair, leaning against it or pushing it without their permission. Um, so for a lot of people, the wheelchair, somebody's wheelchair, somebody's cane, somebody's walker is an extension of themselves. So be really aware of that. That is a, um, make sure you have permission before you do something like that. Um, patting the head of a little person and or a woman, uh, had this happen multiple times, um, touching a black woman's hair or a Muslim woman's headscarf, rubbing a pregnant woman's belly, 
uh, without their permission, putting your hand on somebody to quiet them, to, to um, essentially uh, hold them down, right? Um, each of these can be belittling. They can be offensive. It can hold people back, hold people down. It's not okay to touch somebody without their permission. Um, as an ally, it, it, you know, instead of seeing somebody in a wheelchair and wanting to help them by pushing that wheelchair, perhaps open the door for them. Um, perhaps, you know, if it's a crowded sidewalk, you know, maybe you can part the way from them about a bit in a subtle way. Um, I've noticed also my, my husband, Wayne, who is black, um, we've been together for several years and I have noticed, we have noticed together just how many times people touch him um, when we're in restaurants, when it's the wait staff, uh, or it's when people are first meeting him. It's usually white or Asian women for some reason. Um, there's some kind of a little bias there and it doesn't make him feel good. It's, um, it can, <laughs> um, it's a really subtle thing, but it, it accumulates over time when somebody experiences that over and over again. Um, so pay attention to pay, pay attention to this. Um, Kimberly says, as someone with a disability that presents with chronic pain, I've noticed folks often misread my body language. It's tricky to both be fully myself and also be mindful of how the subtext of my body language can reach others when I'm actually engaged in listening. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Kimberly. And, um, so also, also I would say then as a result of that is, is don't assume that somebody is when they're closed off, that they're doing it intentionally. And I have to remind myself of this as a speaker too, um, because uh, not everyone can have that open body language. Um, so thank you for that reminder. Racist, sexist, or ableist nonverbal actions. So when I was young, my mom used to lock the door when she saw somebody suspicious coming down the street. And who looks suspicious? Often your biases are coming into play, right? Um, I still remember one time specifically, distinctly, when a black man was walking down the street and noticed that she locked the door, noticed that he noticed. That sound of the door locking can be heard. Imagine how it makes people feel, right? Um, I'm sure she doesn't remember, and hopefully she no longer does this, does this um, but it's a little bias that creeped in and created harm. So other ways that this comes out, crossing to the other side of the street when you see a black man coming towards you on the sidewalk, uh, grabbing your purse when you see a black man near you, or a black woman, um, calling the police when you see a black person in your neighborhood or calling security uh, when at your workplace, uh, assuming that they don't belong, assuming they don't belong in your neighborhood, in your workplace, um, uh, it, at Tech Inclusion uh, a couple of years ago, Leslie Miley, who was the director of engineering at Google Cloud at the time, shared just how many times people at Google, security guards and colleagues, people who worked at Google, would ask him about his past. They didn't ask the white people around him. They asked him about his past. They wanted to see his, his past to make sure that he belonged. And, as the director of engineering, how many times over and over that happens? How does that make somebody feel? Um, also, other other things like um, along these lines, referring to sign language by just waving your hands in a nonsensical way, um, using an animal refer reference when referring to a person, uh, and a monkey, an ape, a cougar, all of these things. These are quite racist and sexist and um, uh, clearly something you shouldn't do. Using a cat or cougar gestures or gestures about somebody's body when describing a woman. Um, these are demeaning and derogatory actions that must be eliminated. We have to stop them. They're harmful to us all. Refrain from calling security or calling the police because somebody looks suspicious. Um, this is a bias that puts black people in harm's way far too often. So it needs to be unlearned. Recognize and reverse your biases when you assume someone is a criminal or somebody doesn't belong. Really recognize that. Stop yourself in that moment. Uh, if you feel tense when a black man or, um, or a brown man walks down the street next to you at night or uh, toward you at night, recognize that. 
recognize you're tensing up and, and then do the opposite, show warmth instead, because you know that this happens over and over again. Um, so also avoidance. Um, microaggressions can be nonverbal and passive too. That fear that you might say or do the wrong thing or not know how to approach somebody can often lead to avoiding them altogether. And this avoidance can have a long-term effect on somebody's life. I had no idea this was an issue until I spoke with Victor Khaleesi, who's the commissioner at the mayor's office for people with disabilities in New York. And we did speak with him in, uh, I believe in season four. So you can go back and look at that, listen to that episode as well. So um, this could show up as not interviewing or approaching somebody because you don't know how or don't know how to accommodate them. Um, when we had an Ability in Tech Summit um, uh, back in 2016 to really address diversity, equity, and inclusion in the tech industry for people with disabilities, uh, there were so many companies that didn't come to our career fair. And what they said was they didn't know how to accommodate or their people hadn't been taught how to speak to people with disabilities. Um, they're human, right? <laughs> speak to people with disabilities the way you would speak to any human, um, or do the work, which is not a lot of work, to teach them um, so that you don't uh, keep people from opportunities. Um, so it also comes out avoiding the seat next to a person with a marginalized identity. Um, that might be on a, on a train, on a bus, that could be uh, in a conference room, or sitting further away than in a normal conference in a normal, further away from them, um, whether that's in an interview or in a conversation. Um, <laughs> Michelle says uh, I, she was there at the Ability and Tech Conference. It was great. And those companies missed out. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Um, it can also show up as asking different questions in a job interview because you're afraid to ask the, the deeper questions. Or assume, or maybe you assume that you know the response without asking. Um, bias creeping in again, uh, not giving somebody proper feedback to really grow. This happens a lot with women in particular, and people with underrepresented uh, uh, and people with other uh, underrepresented identities, particularly race and ethnicity, and then intersectionally as well. So a lot of women of color don't receive the proper feedback to really grow. They they get feedback around their personality traits rather than feedback around their skills and expertise. So all of this can obviously, it, um, it is offensive and uh, can harm people uh, emotionally. And also it results in really low employment rates for people with disabilities. It can significantly affect somebody's career um, with lack of opportunities and um, lack of opportunities to grow. Um, this is even easier to do in the remote workplace, actually. So a lot of us are remote right now. Um, be really conscious of this. Are you avoiding people? Even just not really thinking about it, but some there's something in there that's you're not reaching out to somebody. Um, you're not including somebody because you have a fear of doing or saying something wrong or acknowledging that something is going on in their lives, right? Um, that, that we have these, I'm gonna talk about my environmental microaggressions in a second. Um, sometimes we have this fear of saying or doing the wrong thing around um, social injustice, around AAPI hate and violence. And so we do nothing, we say nothing. So in addition to verbal and nonverbal microaggressions, there's what Daryl Wing Sue calls environmental microaggressions. Um, and uh, we'll share the link again for the work that Daryl Wing Sue has done, which showed in the last episode as well. Um, he calls environmental microaggressions demeaning and threatening social, educational, political, or economic cues that are manifested on systemic and environmental level levels. So mascots, advertisements, media images of racial injustice and Bruce police brutality over and over and over again, um, and the biases that, that are in the media around who is portrayed as um, perpetrators and, um, and so on. We talked about that in, in, um, in the episode around biases, and it can become a microaggression as well, an environmental microaggression as well. Um, 
inaccurate and belittling portrayals of somebody's identity in films and television. So, you know, <laughs> Wayne and I were watching a show, uh, a new show the other day, and uh, it made us feel awful. We uh, both regretted watching it. We watched the first episode of it. And I won't name the show um, because it happens so much. It's, you know, I can be talking about several shows. Um, but in it, all there were lots of Black people in the show, and they were all the ones that were killed. And they were killed brutally um, with a shot to the forehead. Um, and, and often they were abused ahead of time and they were verbally abused afterwards as if their bodies and their lives didn't matter. And uh, the black woman that was in the show uh, and actually all the, all, there was a lot of nudity in the show. Um, all the people who were nude were black. Um, so they were showing depicting black bodies in a very different way than white bodies. Um, so this, you know, this, this made us both feel awful. And obviously Wayne, who is black, even more awful. And it, these are environmental microaggressions. Um, and they, they affect you over time. They cloud, they, they uh, affect how you show up the next day and, and how um, knowing how people feel about you society feels about you. And then also this um, just general lack of representation in magazines and novels and textbooks and videos and other media um, advertisements, all of this can make somebody feel like they're, um, like they don't belong, like they don't belong in, in society. And this is all um, environmental microaggressions. Um, this is hard stuff. And <laughs> um, so I appreciate you all listening to this. Um, so um, some specifics, cultural appropriation, exploitation, denigration. Um, so cultural appropriation is also called cultural misappropriation. It's uh, inappropriate, unauthorized adoption or co-opting of language, of music, of hairstyles, of attire, fashion, art, traditions, culture, um, and history of another culture. The appropriator is usually somebody from a majority or dominant culture who co-ops from a marginalized culture. Not always though. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples uh, here. So we, we all can do this. Um, we all find ourselves, might find ourselves doing this. Uh, often um, that's removing an object or a culture or tradition from its original context and placing it in the context of the dominant culture. Um, so individual acts of cultural appropriation are generally nonverbal microaggressions, and then a brand's acts of cultural appropriation are environmental microaggressions. Um, so uh, this might show up by somebody saying, you know, I love the culture. I'm wearing corn cornrows um, to show my appreciation or kente cloth or bindi or headdress or war paint or kimono or sombrero. Um, Brands using stereotypical tropes, cultural icons, or historical figures as mascots, as logos, or as their brand names. Uh, sampling or popularizing music from another culture without recognition or compensation. Um, so just a, a few examples of those. Uh, the Ter Katy Perry dressing as a Japanese geisha at the Video Music Awards. Um, Carly Kloss wearing a native ceremonial war bonnet. Um, on the on the runway, Kim Kardashian West um, has worn cornrows a few times. Um, Selena Gomez uh, uh, appeared at Dancing with the Stars with a bindi on her forehead, and then a Bollywood inspired routine. Um, Beyonce actually did something similar, dressing as a Bollywood actress once as well. Um, speaking with somebody else's accent or dialect. We see this with black scent, um, for example. Um, art, dance, or writing that replicates or borrows heavily from another culture without attribution, permission, or cultural context. So um, also uh, it comes out in media around casting actors or models to play historical or cultural figures from identity that's not their own, from an identity that's not their own. So for example, white actors playing Asian or black roles watched for this, um, it happens a lot. Um, or cisgender actors playing transgender roles or non-disabled actors playing disabled roles. 
Um, also wearing black blackface, brown face, yellow face, obviously those are racist and uh, environmental microaggressions. Um, toys, games, videos, movies that popularize and monetize cultural figures um, and traditions without permission or without their cult cultural context. Um, yeah, uh, David, um, David asks, uh, that's where there, or says, um, that's where there needs to be conversations uh, to expand upon the idea of showing up authentically at work. In theory, yes, we want people to be accepted, to feel accepted for who they are. In practice, can you handle the generational trauma carried over or can underrepresented folks only show up authentically in ways that make you, the majority, feel comfortable? Yeah, yeah, that's a, a great point. Um, um, Ling Wang, uh, I, I'm going to hold your question uh, for the end uh, around critical race theory. Uh, we've addressed it a little bit in past episodes, but I, I'm happy to talk about it if we have time. Um, so uh, appropriation of indigenous culture permeates most regions where indigenous people were colonized. And a lot of people see this as an extension of colonization. Um, and you see it in sports teams. The Kansas City American football team is called the Chiefs, where celebrities bang on a drum as the crowd with many wearing war paint and headdresses. The, the crowd does the tomahawk chop. Um, Atlanta Braves baseball team adopted the tomahawk chop as well, um, where they literally hoist foam tomahawks. These are environmental aggressions that can be very, microaggressions that can be very hurtful. Um, and actually, after the murder of George Floyd on May 25th, 2020, uh, several companies had an internal recognition of this and a reckoning with this. Um, uh, both their lack of in in diversity, equity, and inclusion internally, but also the cu cultural appropriation of some of their brands and racism of some of their brands. So, um, so a lot of brands have, you know, had an awakening and started to change. Um, Dryer's Eskimo Pie. Washington Redskins, the Quaker Oats Aunt Jemima brand, Conagra's uh, Mrs. Butterworth, Mars, Uncle Ben's, um, Col Colgate Palmolive's Darley Toothpaste, Nestle's Redskins and Chico's, many others. Um, obviously all racist. Um, and uh, more needs to be done here. There's still a lot. Um, these brands are appropriating, stereotyping, perpetuating notions of enslavement, of servitude. Um, and there's actually a museum in Michigan that's dedicated to uh, racist memorabilia like this. There's a whole a museum if you wanna look at all the brands that have done this over time. Um, so as a general rule, avoid wearing, practicing, or making money from aspects of another's, another person's cultural identity or another group's cultural identity, unless you have been given per permission, explicit permission to do so. If you admire and respect the culture, learn from them, purchase items directly from them and attribute that work back, um, you know, use it as a learning opportunity, as an education opportunity. Uh, you have a powerful voice um, so you can help create change. And if you see someone or a brand who is culturally appropriating, let them know, let them know. Um, they may not be aware and, um, brands often listen to their consumers, right? So the more that we all speak about it, the more that we all talk about it, the better. Um, and then protest uh, with marginalized people when they're fighting to reclaim their cultural icons, which a lot of indigenous people are right now. Um, okay, so other environmental microaggressions in the workplace. Um, leadership is not diverse and inclusive. Um, their team, the leadership team isn't diverse. Uh, Microaggressions and inequities are allowed to occur without people of authority intervening. Um, so it's a, a good thing to start doing some training at the top level of your organization so that they know how to intervene because it's their job. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are terms used by leadership in a hollow way without true action. So they're performative, they're public statements, but there's no real work actually being done. Uh, a lack of Leadership diversity shows people you may not value people like them as leaders. And there's a glass ceiling 
or bamboo ceiling uh, for people with underrepresented identities. Um, not focusing on diversity, equity, and inclusion as a leadership team also communicates to people that you don't care about um, the needs and um, the inclusion of people with underrepresented identities. So if you're a leader, work on diversity, equity, and inclusion on your leadership team. And if you're not, you can still advocate for a diverse and inclusive leadership in your company. Uh, that can make a big difference. Also, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is not a priority in the culture. Um, so that shows up as leadership caring about diversity, equity, and inclusion, but maybe managers don't prioritize it. So it doesn't actually permeate through the organization or asking people with underrepresented identities to fix diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, and so the, the, uh, the work is on uh, people with underrepresented identities. Um, often that's without compensation as well. Sometimes it's a, um, a volunteer group that does a lot of work on the side in addition to their daily job, in addition to the microaggressions they face, in addition to the exclusion that they face. Um, it can also be not acknowledging the impact of environmental microaggressions and discrimination that people experience outside of the workplace. Maybe the company website or marketing or advertisements show a lack of diverse representation. Or uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is addressed through Black History Month and Women's History Month events or ERGs, but they're not addressed systemically and culturally in the organization. Or the company only prioritizes diversity for women. Uh, we actually see, have heard this a lot. You know, people say, well, you know, we'll get to the other groups after we get gender right. Uh, that's a microaggression, um, can be a macroaggression as well, but an envi environmental microaggression. Uh, company holidays aren't inclusive. The company doesn't take into account caregiver schedules when hosting events, um, when uh, scheduling work days, when scheduling meetings, and even that food and beverages offered are not inclusive. Um, which you know, if you're if you're offering food and beverages, you should uh, offer them for everyone. Um, and really uh, keep in mind all all of the cultural needs, dietary needs that people have. So prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion across the organization from the top to the bottom through the middle. Hold leaders accountable for creating change and address diversity, equity, and inclusion for all underrepresented groups. Um, and then go beyond events, beyond ERGs to, to, to deep systemic change. Um, not to say that uh, events and ERGs are important and, and a crucial piece of this, and we need that systemic change. So also ensure that your brand and messaging reflect diversity, equity, and inclusion, offer flexible holidays so people can take the day off, the days off that they want to celebrate. Um, consider flexible hours to accommodate parents and other caregivers and remote options. We all know, we all have all seen how it easy it can be to be remote. And, and so now it's time to uh, make remote an option for all. So uh, accessibility and accommodation are not inclusive, um, can also be a microaggression, uh, environmental microaggression. So the eccentric, so we, we did an event uh, once and they said that they had a accessible entrance to the event. Well, it turned out that it was down a dark alley, far from the main entrance, required you to buzz in and wait for somebody to answer in this dark alley. That's, that's not really inclusion, right? Um, also signage, shelves, food and supplies are at a level that's too high for people who use wheelchairs, little people or people of short stature. Um, or every time somebody with a disability wants to attend an event or a meeting, they have to ask for accommodation. So inclusion is about showing up and being included when you're there. Um, that's not asking to be included. <laughs> Uh, so uh, the company website doesn't include basic accessibility features, 
uh, these are these all show that accessibility is either ignored or it's an afterthought, afterthought rather than a priority, and it can make somebody feel un, un, undervalued um, and othered. So design with accessibility in mind from the beginning. Um, with input from people with disabilities. Uh, if you know somebody with a disability is joining your meeting or event, make sure the accessibility is there, it's in place, so they don't have to ask. That's true inclusion. Um, technology is not inclusive. So I've spoken at several events where microphones picked up men's voices well, but not women's voices. <laughs> um, or in meeting rooms, uh, this happened when I was an executive. We had in our conference rooms, we had these uh, these uh, conference phones and they didn't pick up women's voices very well. Uh, so we had these long conference tables and every time I wanted to speak, I had to pull the phone from the middle to me in order to speak. Anytime any women wanted to speak, they had to pull the phone over. Often uh, it was too far to reach, right? Um, Voice activated technology often doesn't pick up accents well. Uh, so many offices and events use technology that's not accessible, that's not inclusive, um, where disabled people can't participate, where um, people with accents can't participate, where women can't participate. Each of these is othering and a barrier to participation. So keep that in mind, um, technology matters. Um, and then microaggressions in the physical workplace, just other things to think about. Um, lactation rooms, make sure you have them. Uh, I worked in places where the only place to, to pump breast milk is in the broom closet or a bathroom stall. You need a, you need a safe and clean space, preferably with a refrigerator um, and a sink uh, so that, that people can pump breast milk. Um, there isn't a place in the office to pray or to meditate or to have quiet time. Um, quiet time for people with disabilities, that is key. And for many people, it's, it's key for introverts as well. Um, praying and meditating is a part of somebody people's daily lives. Um, also, safe all gender restrooms um, for people who are trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming. Uh, sometimes even there are fewer West restrooms for women in the office or from for people who are non-binary. Um, all gender restrooms might be like three floors down and um, that person has to walk three floors down every time they need to use the restroom. Um, sometimes it's around meeting rooms that are named after men or uh, they reflect only one cultural identity. Um, Images of successful people or quotes on the office walls aren't diverse. Physical spaces are difficult to navigate for people with disabilities, for people in wheelchairs, you, uh, for wheelchair users, um, or event space lacks accessible seating. All of these things can be environmental microaggressions. And uh, please feel free to share others that are coming to mind for you all. Um, so how do, how do we interrupt them? Um, We've talked about a lot of ways in our last, last episode around interrupting them in ourselves through learning, understanding what causes harm and self-regulating. Um, there are systemic interventions and direct interventions. So we, we can't go too much into this in this episode. So I'll just um, give you a few things to think about here. Um, so systemic interventions, we, we spoke about these last time too, creating a team culture where it's okay to learn and call each other out around microaggressions, creating processes that might reduce microaggressions, like meeting processes, like codes of conduct, anti-racism policies, um, accessibility and inclusion policies, et cetera. Um, and, then, and then training and educational programming so people can learn. So uh, just a couple of things to think about around direct intervention. So in the moment, what can you do? Uh, you can interrupt my uh, interrupt interruptions. So you're in a meeting and you realize that a few people from underrepresented identities just haven't said a word. They haven't ha been able to get a word in. Uh, while the people with overrepresented identities have dominated the conversation, you can say something like, you know, I'm noticing that several folks haven't had a chance to speak yet. Um, I'm, I wanna make the space and open the floor if you have thoughts about this. Um, 
you know, Serena, Sam, Lee, I, I know you um, have great thoughts about this. I'd love to hear them. You know, opening it up. So don't make it obligation. It, don't make it an obligation, but open up the floor um, for that to happen. Open up the conversation. Um, echo and attribute. So often somebody with an underrepresented identity has an idea and it's dismissed. And then somebody else takes it up and is championed. So in that moment, you might say, you know, right, I remember when Sally brought that up several days ago. I love it. Sally, I know you put some work into this or you put some thought into this, but didn't get fully heard. Do you want to share more about your idea or perhaps, perhaps talk about it in the next meeting? Um, call people in to give their full attention. If you notice that people aren't paying attention, um, say something or do something about that. It could be, you know, hey, uh, I just want to pause for a moment because I'm noticing we're not fully present for Ruchika. Um, and this is an important conversation that we need to have as a team. You know, uh, it's been a long day, but let's really focus. Or, you know, maybe let's pause and have, take a break and then come back so that we can really focus on this. Um, you know, something in there. Um, just do something. Find what works for you, what resonates for you. It might be just redirecting the conversation if there's harm being caused and you don't feel comfortable or you don't feel safe intervening in the moment um, by calling, you know, by, by explicitly talking about a microaggression. You might just steer the conversation in a new direction and then address it privately afterwards. So it could be, you know, how, how about we talk about the next thing on our agenda or you could just change the subject, something to kind of move things in a different direction and then make sure that, that you do address it afterwards. Um, you know, so when you're talking with somebody about microaggressions, they might be a little bit defensive. This is hard stuff. Um, so explain um, as much as you can how it might impact somebody and give the alternative. And if you can personalize it by saying something about your own journey, that can make a difference. Um, so, you know, I, I, I know you, uh, you said this uh, earlier in a meeting and it really didn't sit right with me. And I used to say that too, until I learned that it's harmful and here's why it's harmful. So now I say this other thing that is more inclusive. Um, so something like that, where it's, it's, it's calling somebody in, it's letting them know that you used to do that too. And then you learned and you're sharing that, that, that um, so you're sharing what you learned. Um, it's really important not to shame people. Um, shame is not a motivator for behavior change. It is a barrier to behavior change. So if your goal is to change somebody's behavior, um, it's not uh, effective to use shame. Um, feelings of failure, shame, or guilt can make somebody step out of a commitment to allyship. So they're less likely to be vulnerable. They shut down. They're less likely to take risks. Uh, Instead, meet them where they are, provide that constructive, empathetic feedback, and offer them the tools they need when they need them to, to grow. Um, and this is an extra burden, I know, um, for those of us who have underrepresented identities who um, are, is, experience microaggression, as, but it is the way to create change. Um, and then uh, lastly, treat the impact. Um, most trainings, most books and tools that discuss intervening don't include this last, last step that's really important to create, to, to repair the harm. Uh, we know microaggressions can be incredibly depleting and can affect somebody's health and happiness and the effects last far beyond that moment of a microaggression. So check in privately um, for somebody, with somebody who's experienced a microaggression listen to how they're doing, validate their experience, let them know you heard them, you appreciate them, you saw what happened and you're not okay with it. And, and talk with them about how you might be more helpful next time even, um, um, when they're ready. Um, this, you know, as we know, microaggressions can be exhausting and impact somebody's courage, their confidence, their self-esteem. Um, so make sure they know that they're a valuable member of the team, that you value your, their skills and experiences, that their ideas are important and they're needed, and continue to show this throughout the weeks and months afterwards. Um, so I, I've talked in, a, a, in the past about micro affirmations, um, and we can't talk too much about this here today, but um, 
micro affirmations, little ways that you can counter microaggressions by affirming people, listening actively, showing you trust them, showing you trust their experience, their expertise, validate and recognize them in meetings. Um, give them those, those positive facial cues, um, those body language cues that you, you care, you're listening, you're acknowledging, um, you're hearing them. And then give them confidence building feedback, um, which we saw in the first episode of this series uh, in season four, um, that, that that's one of the highest ranking um, things that people want from allies is giving them confidence and courage. Okay, that was a lot. Um, we discussed verbal microaggressions, nonverbal microaggressions, and environmental mic microaggressions. So I just want to pause and see if you all have any additional questions. How does this resonate for you? What did you learn? Um, and, and while I'm kind of waiting, um, to hear more from you. I will address the, the critical race theory is um, just kind of briefly because I have, we have addressed this before in, in a different episode. Um, I personally think that we make a mistake when we call it critical race theory rather than we just call it history. Um, you know, we're teaching history when we're saying, we're, we're doing an additive and saying, now we're teaching history with a critical race theory rather than redoing our textbooks and telling the whole story. Um, so I think it's actually taking us out of what really needs to happen systemically is, is really um, redoing our history, redoing our education system so that it is um, telling the whole story, that it is, uh, it, it is not just one perspective of history. Um, and I, so I, I, I think critical race theory, um, you all, I, many people probably don't, uh, haven't heard too much about it, but critical race, the, the argument is, do we do it or not, especially in education, especially in, uh, in uh, K through 12 education. And, and I, I personally believe that we need to stop talking about critical race theory and start talking about changing our education uh, systems, what we, what we talk about, what we learn in our education systems, redo our textbooks, so that they are telling everybody's story. I hope that helps. <laughs> um, Angel says, uh, yeah, I, I've heard of micro inclusions, but hadn't heard of micro affirmations. I'll definitely add that to my vocabulary. Yeah, cool, awesome. Great. Yes, you're welcome, Lee. Awesome. All right, um, I, I can't see the Q&A, but I don't think that there are any, any questions there. So I'm just gonna move forward um, here uh, to kind of close things up. Um, this was season four. Um, and I think I mentioned that uh, my book is available for pre-order. Uh, so thank you for sharing, for purchasing, for reading it when it arrives, for sharing it with people who need it. Um, and, and, and I also just want to say that I'm uh, looking for a few more places to speak during the book tour, September and October. So if you're interested in, in bringing a speaker into your company or know of a good conference coming up, please let me know. Um, you, you can, my, the email contact at changecatalyst.co will go to the whole team. So um, yeah, I appreciate you all. Um, this was season four. Uh, make sure to go back and have a listen or a watch or watch uh, the other episodes of this if you didn't get a chance. And also we have a year's worth of content with amazing leaders. So at ally.cc, you can see all of the episodes. And um, next week we have the ICON Summit, um, which I mentioned uh, at the very beginning. Uh, it's specifically for black and brown men in tech focused on mental health and professional development. Um, and you can learn more at the iconproject.org slash summit. It's free to attend, so please share it. Um, and you can also learn more about the Icon Project and donate to the therapy fund at the iconproject.org. Um, so go check that out. That's next week. And then season five, um, we are going to take a break for the next few weeks and we'll be back 
on a regular weekly live schedule uh, starting September 9th. September 7th, sorry, starting September 7th. So make sure to join us then. We'll have a special episode on September 14th, which is the day of the book launch. So stay tuned for more details there. And please share this with your teams. Help, help us grow this amazing community and the learning, the empathy, the action of allyship, of advocacy, of all this amazing work. So thank you all for all you do. Hope you have a healthy, happy summer. And we will see you in September. Thank you, Siobhan, uh, Michelle, David, appreciate you, Jackie. Good to see you all. All right, have a great one. Appreciate you all and all the work that you do.